three events of the fall semester, fall 2023 semester, uh, titled Reimagining the Poetics of the Small Press. Um, my name is Jared, and uh, for those of you who are just joining uh, for attending uh, the series for the first time, Reverie is a monthly event program coordinated by students in the Department of Comparative Literature at the CUNY Graduate Center, um, hosting affiliated faculty and guest speakers from broad areas of interdisciplinary practices. Reverie seeks to provide a platform for personal reflection and public discourse on issues in and around poetry and poetics, vertical fiction, theoretical criticism, independent publishing, and translation. Um, so I am tremendously excited to welcome and present editors and authors from Future Poem Books, uh, which recently celebrated its 20th anniversary, I believe, uh, last year, I think. Um, 2000, I believe, is when the press started. Um, a little bit about Future Poem, and, and we'll get into a lot of details um, shortly. Um, Future Poem is based in New York City. Uh, it is a not-for-profit publishing collaborative dedicated to presenting innovative works of contemporary poetry and prose by both emerging and underrepresented writers. Um, unlike other presses, uh, which often rely on a hierarchical editorial structure, uh, Future Poem's rotating panel of guest editors shares the responsibility for selecting, designing, and promoting the books it publishes. Uh, and more recently, Future Poem launched uh, Future P, a digital publishing platform that provides a space for writers and multi-genre artists to explore process and produce work for special projects. Uh, again, we'll get into sort of the nitty gritty uh, very soon, um, but I would like to just uh, introduce our panelists tonight, uh, Dan Macklin, Aidan Farrell, Stefan Lawrence, and Moran Opsonius. Um, Dan Macklin is the founder and executive editor of Future Poem Books. He is a poet, performer, editor, and designer of digital things. He lives in New York City. His work has appeared in Colorado Review, Bond, Brooklyn Rail, Oversound, Recluse, and has been featured at the ICA Boston and MoMA PS1. His books and chapbooks include Dear Body, Six by Seven, This Side Facing You, and In Rem. Um, he is taught writing at Naroko University and the Poetry Project, and is a current curator for the Segway Reading Series at Artist Space with singer, cellist, Serena Yost. He has recorded several music text collaborations and will be performing with her on October 21st at the Shipyard Series near Washington, D.C. Um, everyone's bios are also up on our event web page, so I do encourage you to maybe check out some of their books and uh, links and work as well. Um, Amy Farrell is the managing editor of Future Phone Books. He's a poet, translator, and educator. His translation of The Vitals by uh, Nali de Culturelog is forthcoming from World Poetry Books, and he's currently translating two other texts of Nari's, Vogue and Vanities. Aiden has two chapbooks, Lilac, Lilac, and Organism, Algorithm. His work is featured or forthcoming in Denver Quarterly, Wonder, Penn's Digital, Belleville, Park Pages, and elsewhere. Um, and our two future poem authors tonight is Stefan Lawrence, uh, who's a writer and artist from Brooklyn, a graduate of the MFA and writing program at Pratt Institute, who is interested in otherworldly poetics and the creation and cultivation of emancipatory poetic spaces with felt sentiments that have been marginalized, displaced, or estranged from dominant culture. Um, and I hope we can maybe talk a little bit about that uh, in our conversation. Uh, her work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in Cosmonauts Avenue. Horses Press, Clean Mobs, Tea House, Twitter Mob, Fanzine, and other places. Her micro chat Germs is available from Voice the Press, and her chat for People's Win is available from Resolving Post. Um, Stefan's first poetry, her full length poetry collection, is You Know How Much I Hate Being a Woman in Social Situations, um, which was published by Future Poem this year. Uh, and this is the lovely boss of our cover of the book. Um, 
Miranda Arsanios is the author of the short story collection, The City Outside the Sentence, Notes on Mother Tongues, and the Autobiography of Language, published by Night, uh, excuse me, Future Poem in 2022. She was contributed uh, essays and short stories to Eflux, Vita, the Brooklyn Rail, Lit Hub, and Guernica, among others. Arsanios co-founded the collective 98 Weeks Research Project in Beirut and is the founding editor of Moxine, a bilingual English Arabic magazine for innovative writing. Um, and just following our panel discussion, we'll also hear readings from uh, Miran and Stefan, um, and then we'll conclude the with the Q&A that we as questions. Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, so I wonder, and this is sort of a, a tiered or scaffold of question um, for each of you, um, to introduce future poem from different angles of conception and reception. Uh, I wonder if we can start with Dan, uh, if you can tell us about your, your sort of impetus to start the press, what the vision was, um, and if you can maybe take us briefly to the evolution of this future. Um, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, so I think it's difficult to know why you start a project when you first do it. I, uh, I actually started it uh, a few years out of graduate school in 2002. Um, and uh, I think it was, um, you know, impulse and it was, you know, you find friends like my people. I had a designer friend and we both loved books. Um, I come from a family like that like books. My sister is here as a graphic designer, and my mom was uh, was a poet and a uh, lover of books. So, uh, uh, so there's there's sort of precedent for for it. Um, but I also think that um, I credit my teachers for laying a foundation for the type of press I wanted to to start. So I. Um, I studied, was fortunate to study with Bernadette Mayer at, at the Poetry Project, and I took her experiments in uh, experiments in writing workshop, which uh, you know pretty much changed my life and worldview. Uh, and I think my takeaway from that was that writing can be anything, and everything's permissible, and there are no wrong wrong ways to go about it, which I think kind of describes a little bit some some of the impulse behind future poem. And then the other person I I was fortunate to study with was at City College and sometimes here at the Cheney Grad Center, which was Ann Latterback. Um, and Ann was at the time maybe at the time there were maybe not that many poetry workshop teachers who taught like this, maybe there are a lot more now, but I think rather than teaching something about craft, it was really about uh, questions, fundamental questions that that were not just confined to the world of poetry, but it was questions that are being answered by artists, visual artists, and uh, people who are writing theory, uh, and and poets and um, poetry Jason people and you know all sorts of so I think that's what and uh, you know instilled in me and the rest of the writers that were there uh, was this kind of uh, uh, an idea of frameworks maybe or the idea that you're creating a landscape with your own work and and. In some ways, that's what the press aspires to do is to create a landscape where many different kinds of things are possible. So those are two really uh, touch points for me uh, in terms of my teaching. And then just to the, the briefly, the evolution was it started as like books that, of people I knew. <laughs> so uh, people I admired from graduate school, Derek Caliber, Rachel Levinsky, who I knew from the poetry world, and I really liked was her work. Um, and then quickly I became much more interested in the collective models that were popping up around the writing world. So there was groups Gaia and West Coast who had a similar model to us 
uh, with having multiple writers choose books, uh, not just one editor or, or a set of permanent editors. Then there was eventually subpress, which had more of an economic collective model where everybody came in and, and they published people that they wanted to support. So lots of different interesting things, and those are just two of them. But I think this idea led to the idea that we have still today, which is, um, and both of uh, Moran and Stefan's books were selected this way, was a rotating panel of writers, editors, um, critics, artists that that will read the work that comes in every year and have a conversation with a, a more permanent or you know the, the more long term editors of the press. And then kind of select the work that they feel is important for that year. Um, and so it kind of evolves as this, you know, they're di those people are different and they, they kind of answer the question about what is future public? You know, so that, and I think we try not to supply them with the answer up front, like they know what we published and they kind of know that generally we're looking for things that may not be championed elsewhere. And so that it's kind of evolved that way and it's built on itself. Um, and then eventually, and I think this was an aspiration from the beginning. It wasn't, I, I wanted it, and I think you know, the people who became involved wanted it to be not just about books. And, uh, you know, eventually, first it became some interesting events, like we had multidisciplinary events where that were, it would be a, a, a book, but we'd invite all sorts of different artists, including dancers and musicians to respond to that text. And we had this thing called Future Phone Events, which Chris Martin, who was a poet who was involved, started. Um, and then uh, now we have Future Feed, which is a digital platform where we're kind of expanding behind beyond books. And I think Brian Stefan who was involved in that and we'll talk more to their experience. Um, and and we've done lastly, I would just say we've done um, with our board, because we're a nonprofit, we tried to do these curatorial projects. So part of part of it is to like we have to support the project and we need to fundraise. And we tried to think of interesting, creative ways that would sort of contribute to the life of the press and the conversation, uh, besides just having a benefit. So we we've had, and I can show you some examples later, but we had like artists and writers and well-known people and, and emerging writers do postcards uh, about they would write to the future people in the world to give them instructions, you know, about how to, you know, uh, it was sort of instructions for the future people. And it was really an amazing set of responses. And we, we have other things like that. So that's just a, uh, my quick summary of how it's evolved over the, over the years. And, and I think I think the last thing I want to say is that it started out as just me, but uh, I was fortunate to have people like Aiden and Jennifer Tamayo, who uh, was the former managing editor, and a whole bunch of other people that were currently involved and previously involved, and maybe had the instinct to, to kind of uh, take their input very seriously about how we could change things. And, um, you know, so I think that's been a big part of it too, is that, you know, when you have a project like this, it starts out as your idea, but it really uh, evolves because people are sometimes giving you things that confront your idea about what you thought it should be and in a good way. So I think I, I, I just wanted to say that as well. Thanks, Dan. I, I really love the idea of uh, finding what's possible. And, uh, the press undergoing its process of, of expanding um, a, a landscape of things that, that's um, super interesting. Um, maybe we can talk about that a little later. Um, I wanted to then ask uh, Aiden uh, if uh, you're able to tell us how you became involved with the Future Forum. Um, and what you see is sort of the impact of the press is uh, uh, the impact of the press is today's sort of small publishing events. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, the story is sort of like how I became involved is um, <clears throat> it's pretty simple. And I think that like it really surprised me at the time that it was so simple. Um, I was very fortunate. I was um, 
studying uh, poetry at the New School for my undergrad. And my last semester there, I was um, studying with Wendy S. Walters, who at the time, this was in uh, like 2018, 2017. And um, she had come out with uh, Troy, Michigan, which is a Chicago title from I believe 2015. It was a relatively recent release. And um, I don't really remember actually like what drove me to be like really connected with it. I think I really wanted to be involved in the community and um, something about the way that future poem was presented was really attractive to me, the aesthetic of the work. Um, somehow there was like a sense of like greed. I think that that really didn't work that like really to me. Um so she connected me with Dan and uh, Carly Dashiel, who was the managing editor before me. Um and I started uh, off as a reader during the open call, um, which happened right before uh the came in uh that year. Um and I kind of just after that, like I offered to go. I kind of just like imposed myself on the future poem table a little bit. And um and then afterward I was I was asked to be an editorial assistant. And then since then just kind of worn uh I think almost every hat that there has been to wear. Um almost, not every. Oh, you know, always more to learn. Um and uh yeah. I'm very passionate about um, And then Art Impact as a press in today's publishing landscape. I mean, I think like a real privilege um, of being able to be part of this community is that, you know, um, the sort of independent publishing landscape is so dependent on um, community, um, the community of other presses, uh, particularly like the New York City presses, but also of uh, I'll be partner with professors West Coast. Kind of our, um, sometimes in small ways, sometimes in larger ways, where those partnerships kind of evolve. Um, but to be able to contribute to that kind of publishing landscape, I think, is the impact that we can all like share between ourselves. And that's I think something that like allows us to work in common with the landscape, with our particular research. And I think it's like then I was taking the other direction and saying what makes us as different. I mean, a lot of what Dan said, you know, our model, our our sort of like selection model, um, invites dissonance into our process of selection. And um, I mean, something Carly said, I remember a while ago. I forget what the context was, but um, future poem is like as interested in, uh, in terms of the catalog, future film is as interested in continuity as it is in digression. And I think the coexistence of those things um, is like part, or, or is like a symptom or an effect of the sort of organic rotating model. Um, and that often there is dissonance that happens in that final reading that we have um and but it's always it's not a negative thing like it's 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 an invitation for something new to happen mm -hmm. and as an editor it's actually really exhilarating because um i'm not making the decision you know <laughs> which is like scary but also really fun um and uh to be part of that you know a sort of like collective that like make ends up making a decision that no one individual in the collective collective could have made um, is part of what makes our catalog kind of stand out. Um, yeah, totally. Um, I love the the um, the coexistence of the continuity and digression. Um, so I, I I do maybe want to ask uh, Miranda Stefan, um, uh, what was sort of your introduction into the press? Like, how did you take notice of what Future Home was doing? Uh, what was maybe your attraction to future poem as a potential home for your work? <clears throat> for me, um, it started 
when I was at back in the MFA. And I'd gone in there as a fiction writer, but producing fiction and poetry. And I feel like that's when the world of like small press opened up to me. Um, originally, it was actually one of my professors there. So, um, Future Poem was like one of the first essays that I introduced to me, along with um, Simone Lips, but like being dispersed. And I just remember thinking how cool how the books looked. And then going to Ferris, I worked at Lit and Steel House, and it's also a table with Future Poem. So it was kind of like a connection of people before the connection of the books. But once I started, engaging more with the books and the authors and just even like the visuals of the books drew me in so much I was like already a future Chrome fan before I even thought that I would write the book. <laughs> um and I think what made me feel like future Chrome could be a home for my work particularly was the aesthetics of the books and how different each book was. And that really excited me um, because a lot of presses, I feel like there's a lot of same, same a little in each in what they kind of publish, but I think the press and text of each of them are so like expanding, expansive, and cool. Mm -hmm. and so, like, I really wanted to like, know more about it. And, I love also how it, it seems to me like a sort of like the awe comes from a sort of grassroots word of mouth, you know, yeah. you know networking, excuse me, messaging, but uh, a network of, of poets and, and, and people who are um, yeah. or paying toward uh, liberating or, or uh, Paying attention to the human, sorry, to the author himself. Um, it's really great. Uh, and Aaron, I think it's a few things. Um, I think they got to a future poem um, that was getting to know, um, you know, the, the kind of poetry scene in New York. Um, I didn't really know them prior to that because I. Myself had been, I moved to New York in 2016 and um, from here in Lebanon, where it's still not where I'm from. And um, I, was, I was drawn to the city, of course, and also, you know, it was, I had also been you know, there at the Barn, where I'm occupied with some future as well. Um, and But I was in and out of the country because that was a little bit of program, and then I decided to move here in 2016. And uh, I was like really eager to get to know more about, you know, I went to the poetry project a lot and went to a couple meetings um, and just to get more with the texture of the city and as well like its history of the like um, poets and, and poetry scene, et cetera. And so, yeah, I, I think I encountered future form in that way, but it kind of belonged to this, to this kind of um, what I, yeah. To, to the city, like the, the sort of fabric or texture sort of fabric of the city, and how I think I knew Richard Levitsky as well, and so I was attracted to the kind of experimental ethos as well of the press, and I also write some prose, prose, um, prose, prose, <laughs> and um, and so and also and, and just to go back to what Aiden was saying, I think that was the, the relationship between training and digression is like I wouldn't have been a traditional author, I think, for them because I had really no connection with the city prior to moving here. Um, and and I was, you know, through the, the, the future uh, award context, that's how my book selected. Um, it just, you know, I spit and selected. And so, yeah, I, I wouldn't have been probably um, like a, a typical author. And so I think that I got, you know, included in the community, but also, um, Maybe as as a little bit of digression, um, and uh, and I'm really grateful for that. Actually, but I think it's uh, just nice to be part of that constellation of uh, authors and voices. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I love how yeah this this wonder and awe 
yeah, the, the sort of surprise of discovery problem and being woven into the textures of the landscape and the frameworks. Um, we brought all of us, you know, we of all of you together um, under the sort of banner of, of future film. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe get into an elaboration of the uniform mission statement. Um, and maybe just start by asking, what does uh, innovation or, or innovative contemporary poetry mean maybe to each of you? Um, and maybe you can start there. <laughs> um, I I don't know, I was just thinking about it um, as like, I guess sort of just like focusing a little bit on the word innovation, you know? And I have this tendency that I don't like in myself to compare it to the word experimental because I really don't think there's that consequential difference. But in like thinking about it, um, innovation, I think I find it um, a very urgent word. Um, and a word that, uh, describes work that is not a, afraid of being in the context of, of its past and like appropriating it and sort of like changing its brain in order to have like a vision of the present and the future. Um, and I think that like, that that's something that doesn't just go for poetry. I mean, I would, I would, apply that concept like um, yeah I don't know if that was yeah I, I, um, I'm interested in what you're mentioning the slippage the relationship very fragile between innovation and experimentation and experiments. Uh, innovation is a great word in terms of like urgency. It's, it's, I don't know, it sounds like an invitation, right? But also in a sense like a location, right? Like as the, in terms of like a calling, right? Or that it calls for something that uh, needs to be presented, but also um, sort of like the press writing itself into existence, right? That existence is never static. Um, I wonder if anyone else has what they vision as or envision as innovation. I think just to speak to what you're saying, there's also, I see innovation also as a kind of commitment to a poetic project. And I think it's something maybe a common feature, feature in future poems, this is a, is a kind of both an intellectual and artistic project at the same time. And I feel a lot of the authors have, um, have that commitment to a certain kind of poetics. Um, and I'm interested like myself in, and that I feel um, intellectual project doesn't get always articulated in the book per se, but I was reading Future Feed, which is this kind of other platform in which authors are invited to have a conversation with, you know, um, someone, you know, in conversation or, or uh, present the kind of environment in which the work was shaped or something that was important and influential to the writing of the book. And so I feel like um, I'm always very interested in um, where, like, yeah, how the form gets shaped by these larger ideas, and and um, and I'm just like always appreciative of, of people's investment in the kind of intellectual project as well. And I feel like this is something that maybe some future poem scholars have in common. Yeah, um, I I agree with that. Also, when I think of like innovation and being is actually like 
especially when you know for any sort of data passwords, it, mm -hmm. it leads back to the greater reason that I marginalized and the most experienced spaces where people who are often um, not acknowledged for their work are the ones doing the most innovative work. And something I've found with future films is that a lot of the authors and artists that have done this future films are very safe, very innovative, very safe. Um, I remember doing a meeting with um, Sean D. Anderson and Lindsay Chang, and um, John's like creative partner in mind. And it was just such a like amazing experience because they all do a lot with like sound and art in their work too. That I felt was a very like special combination that doesn't happen often, especially with the kind of sound that they do, which is very like certain something. But it's um it's that like commitment to the practice and that like bursting open of like what poetry even is that has been to be really um innovative and special. Yeah, um I mean maybe the, the sort of embodiment of sound of respiration of language is, is maybe the felt sentiment, right? Yeah. Or something like that. Um, just to add yeah, to that, uh, it's just like a really funny thing that as an event that's been involved for such a long time in the project is that that definition changes over time. Like, I think it's kind of what maybe it's what's needed or uh, or what feels neglected or necessary uh, at, at a certain time, you know, and, and, and you know, and um, Sometimes it can be a reaction to something that's not happening. Sometimes it can be like this opportunity that no one else is taking advantage of. Or, you know, so there are the work. I think most recently I've been really interested in just the whole what I what I see with a lot of people's artistic practice is that uh, unlike when I sort of uh, started becoming a writer, people have a lot of permission to have all these different genres or, or manifestations of their practice and don't put limits on it. And I, uh, you know, whether that's visual art aspects or um, performance, when they do the readings, it's not a straight reading, it's performance with visuals and video and uh, maybe it has a, a kind of a, a different kind of relationship with the text on the screen. So anyway, I think those I, I get kind of reflected in some of the choices that we've made recently. I'm excited about that. So, um, yeah, um, I mean, something that uh, you mentioned earlier, Dan, um, about um, you know bringing in the guest editors um, on an early basis, uh, the occasion of different guest editors, and it's about that specific time, right? The the moment, like the context, or maybe helps. Um, it, it 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 has an influence on on what sort of immediate future you were addressing. Maybe if that makes sense. Um, but some something that uh, I wanted to maybe also bring up was. Um, you know, this idea of the intellectual and artistic, um, which to me seems like theory and practice, right? So I'm wondering if, um, you know, in terms of a collective publishing ethos, um, in what ways are, how you see innovation um, transmitted to the magnification of maybe underrepresented uh, writers or authors, which is also part of the future poem mission statement. Um, you know, what dialogues does a non-traditional poetry engage in or dismantle? Um, and do you see aesthetic innovation uh, as a path toward maybe something like social consciousness or, or practical critical activity with our models? You know, practice. <laughs> You know, like how do we how do we turn poetry into action, really? And how does innovation reference to that? Is there any 
Uh, I mean, interesting thing to me is that like um, the interest is really in engaging with unexplored skills in the social sphere um, and making the sphere. And, you know, an exciting thing about that is that we don't know what it is yet because it's unexplored. Um, so innovation kind of just follows naturally, you know, because if it's unexplored, then, you know, it's always got to be something people that are familiar with sitting in the discipline. Um, you know, and um, I forget exactly what the words are for our, our call for the other teachers that we're partly putting together, but you know, it's like for new possibilities in um, new possibilities, new potential sort of in one of the like paths in which the book, the object of the book, sort of etc. Um, and um, yeah, that's kind of like you know the work that we should like end up engaging with that space as well. And I think a lot because of the process, because of like at this point in the time, we do a kind of particular catalog that attracts authors. Um, and um, yeah. I think one thing that like poetry in general has done is allow me to think of like other impossibilities as possible. I think we're pretty limited on how we can do like community and how change can come. Um, but like through these poems that like push those boundaries, it's felt like the book can really have felt like there are other possibilities that we haven't thought of yet. And I think allowing for a form of literature that seems very like hard set in its rules to break those rules and become something else. Um, that sort of reflects that thought of like how I try to move through life. Yeah, there's not like an impossibility in the book. It's very clear. Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe just to add, like, a simple back to the question, maybe uh, marginalized subjects already have a different relationship to language. And so, they're always operating within like you know a different set of parameters and their relationship to kind of um, more uh, canonical or you know conventional sort of language is already a question. Um, and I can see like for me, for example, I've always had a um, a, com a complicated relation with English language, and and. You know, so so in my writing, I've, I've sort of explored a little bit that relationship and questioned it and challenged it. And I, I don't know if like poetry leads to social action, but but I do believe that, you know, it can sort of definitely, um, it can be action on the page, you know, so it can sort of act on the page and get back to language. Uh, and I'm also always thinking, you know, she was one of my mentors, but like Renee Gladman and, and how you know, for her read language, like the sentence is um, is in an action, right? It happens in real time. There's a kind of, uh, yeah, sort of very material and uh, experiential relationship to the page. Um, so really, I feel like, I don't know if it's a social process, but it, it is it's definitely sort of um, inviting kind of new, new kinds of engagement with um, yeah, the page of the book. Yeah, I do feel like it could be action of sort of like, I think it's difficult to like ask for people to be to do like 
have action on one of the important scales that apply to some different things, like the action ends up being um, in challenging a region. Um, and then how that sort of challenge becomes a discussion that I'm saying this was the Chinese. Um, and we have this word engagement. Um, also, in terms of like I mean, the data for it, that the work is engaged in the book is surrounding in a very, in a very material sense. Um, yeah, um, just to give a interesting thing, I was just talking about like, a specific example that I, I think it is like shifting people's consciousness about something, you know, and and uh, so like we published a book. And sometimes it's in an unexpected way. So uh, uh, Irish or Indians, uh, your country is free, was this project. And at the time, it was kind of like a very interesting new kind of idea that he was basically taking uh, Google chat room conversations about why your country is great for all the countries in the world and went through an alphabetical list of the countries and they just sort of stayed through something and uh but like it's it's really hilarious and really sad and also profound and revealing about all these different geographies and what people are saying about them and so like that was to me was just a very interesting example of like uh, the reactions that I that I found people to have when they read that book, and and I think it was just like it's like an opening, you know that 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 book. I think the most uh, like you hope for in the published interesting work or innovative innovative work <laughs> is that it's an opening for people to think in a different way. And, Actually, you would expect that these things would come out about. Yeah, well, that sounds uh, like troubling and, and mostly um, really fascinating uh, to sort of compile or attack the manipulation of what makes something great or you know. Um, but this idea of engagement. And surroundings, or engaging in one's surroundings, and, and also presence. Um, you know, I, I I love the idea, and it seems like this is how it's, uh, or, or this is sort of what brings all these different um, ethics or ethos in, into conversation. Is it just that an action or awareness from an object, from a conversation, from a sentence, the presence of the sentence um, leads for the discussion. Um, and I think that, I mean, uh, having that discussion or conversation, um, it's so fraught nowadays and probably always, um, but there's a risk and a daring that comes with that, you know, engagement as a sort of confrontation or, or, or encounter, um, which future poems seems like it, it would sort of put into, um, approach um uh so i'm wondering uh that there's really so much more we can talk about um i'm wondering if we should continue or maybe go get into some meetings and then pick up with other questions that some of us might have but how do you feel about that maybe we'll, we'll do some some poetry reading yeah <laughs> Um, so that I think from the current is going to yeah. Be. So um, yeah, I think it's really cool now about um, I read prose as kind of part of the book, but yeah, so it's like 10, 12 minutes. I think uh, I'm I'm gonna read a piece from the book, which is a one of the first pieces I wrote. In this collection and it dates back to 2015 when I was still doing my MFA. Um and was starting to think about language, but not explicitly addressing English yet, but kind of starting to interrogate my relationship to my own syntax, etc. So I'm gonna read that and then I'll read a piece from a, a kind of more recent the magic of the work. 
Um, okay, so to be reduced as temperature. My back gets sweaty when I walk the five blocks from the subway to my apartment. My arrangements are temporary, but I have a key that opens a door. When I open it, everything, the couch, the lamp, the droplets, and the rim of the sink is fixed to its place. Even the table is where it was before I left the apartment for language classes. Though I can get by in the language I'm learning, my progress stalled early on when I stopped taking notes in new font of level two, new book name. Tonight, there is a power outage caused by the cold, but it, it is the chilliest winter the city has seen in years. When it's bedded outside and the streets are plunged in darkness, people rush past each other, stand by the bus stop and wait for an island to emerge. They wonder whether it will stay once the power returns. Past the bus stop, I'm intrigued by the endless sentences I hear on the street, words adding up like a string of sausages. My mother too used long sentences when she wrote me letters in the language I'm learning. When I'm walking at night, I took and look for what she might have seen, a tree, a bench, a particularly large nose, one cloud. Though I can get by in the language of learning, I'm not fluent enough to describe the images pulsating behind my eyelids when it's dark outside. In the reading I just attended, a poet said, in order to write, I listen to my body. I have no images to illustrate her sentence, not even with my eyes shut. When I'm inside my apartment and my back is covered in sweat, I take off my shirt and do push-ups on the hardwood floor. I'm closer to change that way. Is that what she meant? On the second block, a man with a full orange beard bounces out of rice for a chicken. He's dragging a rattling cart behind him. Another man calls him, shouting, hey motherfucker, come back. I'm thinking of interviewing the poet on dying and writing. I try to combine these two things in my head, the third one, taking my shirt off. Instead, I yank my flannel to cover my stomach. Wearing cotton flannels under my shirt is a habit I take from my mother. I often think of answering her letters like Chantal Ackerman in his from poem. I would tell my mother about the power shortages of cold and my progress in perfecting the language I already know. She would write back, ranting about my failures as a daughter and saying that she speaks perfectly well, but I can barely understand. I wish I could bring myself to tell someone I hate her. I would end my letter asking for more money, Masade. I'm still on the second block walking, though I'm not sure if I'm walking at this point as I'm lifting and setting down each foot in turn, never having both feet off the ground at once, or if I'm waiting with waist deep in my own steps. On the second or third block, I hear people say that the air is different from the way it used to be, that it is stale and smells of acrylic paint or of dried parsley and this up leaves. They also say that the road is permanently under repair, cratered like the moon. Images contend for my attention. I shut my eyes and try describing the orange color throbbing behind my eyelids in the language I know. Orange the color is harder than a wooden object. After noticing a community garden with colorful noodles depicting children of all races, I pause for a moment. There are trees and butterflies, the word peace and large amphibian fingers holding up the earth. Every time I see that mural, I believe in it. One of the reasons I write the poet is to believe in images. She also said, we get to images, this way of being alive, the narrative. The man with the open ear turns right off the main road, smiling about the, about, about the middle of the street as if it were a sidewalk. Sides and centers get confused and cold. I walk slowly and want to reach the next block or the next one until I reach my apartment, but each step feels like a fall. I utter the words, feel like it feels like a fall, and fall the smooth of my breath until it disappears in the cold air. It is impossible to say if I have ever spoken the words that resulted in those frozen puffs of cloud. On the fourth block, my throat starts to itch, leaves dripping down my nose. 
I walked back to the second block where a woman is standing at the bus stop waiting for number 64. I want to talk to her. She turns around, gazing back at me with vacant, motionless eyes. The bus is arriving. I open my mouth. I want to say something, but my knees give in and I fall to the ground. Stand up, the woman yells, but all I can do is spit. So that's the first story. Um, and then I'll read this other piece, um, which I think speaks perhaps something we haven't really talked about is like the labor involved in the small press uh, and, and um, you know, writers also writing in this kind of uh, literary environment and it's called The Valley of Love. It's a kind of short, short essay. I often say that I don't like to work. Between working and not working, I prefer not to work. I don't dislike my work, but I'm disturbed by the expectations to love it. I found slogans such as love your job and you won't work a day, particularly perverse, borderline abusive. I don't trust people who feel unworthy when trying. Most of the time, I feel lazy and unwilling. Although these feelings don't define me, I have anxieties about becoming what I feel, resentful and angry at those who own my autonomy. I find it hard to differentiate between work and non-work, living and making a living, adjuncting and writing, mothering and teaching. All exist in an undegraded mush of variably complicated tasks I simultaneously love and despise. I love my students, yet resent the circumstances under which I teach. I love to mother, yet feel exhausted by the labor mother requires. I am committed to my craft, yet resent the condition, a vocation whose success rests on the material ability to sacrifice so much of its name. I say that I don't like to work, but I work all the time. I believe that I'm worthy only if I'm productive. I believe that my value is inseparable from the product of my labor. If I do nothing, I'm worth nothing. And if I do a lot, I'm still worth nothing. <laughs> is this called the paradox? I feel as nervous about the time I have to write and about the time I don't have to write. I pay Lydia $20 an hour to babysit Luca while I revise my manuscript. I want this sentence, the one you're currently reading, to disrupt the tight economy of my opening assertion with a more intricate and generous syntax. Details of the domestic life, the large wooden table I write on that I inherited from Rachel, the Lego pieces scattered across the floor and buried in the tight clumps of dust, dead skin, dried spinach, crumbs of tortilla ch chips tangled with hair I can't seem to stop shedding. While I work on revisions, Lydia helps Luca make glue from scratch by mixing flour and water. She doesn't understand how anyone can, can get mad at children. They're just children, she says. I want to return to the paradox I mentioned earlier, the one about finding pleasure in the debasing nature of labor, the stratification required for the sentence to exist in the first place, the time Lydia spends away from her son in order to be with mine. I want to convey the cost of the paragraph, the economy of human relations without which literature wouldn't exist. I want to think of creative work as work. I ask Lydia if she can stay a little longer. I'm not done yet. Can she also put him to bed? I once watched a black and white interview in which Hannah Arendt lit, lights up a cigarette, her stern features partially concealed in clouds of thick smoke. In the interview, she says that she never revises her sentences. Instead, she dictates them to an assistant who types them for her, a direct transposition of thought onto page. Had Erin typed her sentences herself, with her definition of work a noble and fulfilling activity as opposed to labor, an enslaving repetition of tasks aimed at survival rather than creation have been different? Would she have insisted on the dichotomy between fulfilling and debasing forms of work? Or would she have recognized her impossible separation, destructive entanglement, and acknowledged that what most despises us needs us to love it in order to survive? People say that art is a labor of love. People say that love can be quantified. It defies financial and profitable existence. The 300 hours spent on your manuscript, 40 hours of class prep, the 80 years of your life devoted to raising a child, don't count because time is love, and love can be accounted for in standard units of measurement. I still wonder how many sentences can be generated within a minute followed by another one and another until the hour is finally unlocked and media has to leave again. 
They said 10 sentences are typed within 30 minutes span is the value of each word at the end of the length of the sentence. Artists are lucky because their life is their work and work is a work to them. It is life. They are employers or, or former wives or husbands, bank on our devotion to hold us hostage. No, quote, nothing so effectively stifles our life as a transformation into work of the activities and relations that satisfy our desires. Sylvia Tiffany, she wrote. They know more than anything else that our love is real and that it can be quantified. And that and what can be quantified is essential to the survival of this real economy. I'm still unsure if the word paradox effectively conveys their predicament. A paradox is a proposition that apparently sound leads to a conclusion that seems senseless or logically unacceptable. The paradox of work arises from the confusion around the definition of the word love, its loveless localization. Perhaps if I am unable to express in language the uneasy coexistence of two irreconcilable feelings, I truly suck at my job. In fact, I should stop writing and search for a job I have no feelings for. Perhaps I should fall in love and stop complaining about work that is simultaneously love and despise. So many people have it worse. You should appreciate what you have when you have it. Stop biting off the hands that feed you. Love your job and you won't work another day. If you love what you do, it will love you back. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from your book, and then if there's time, possibly a little one. Um, but I kind of want to start with the first poem I wrote when um, I was at Pratt and switched to poetry, and my mentor, Ina, um, basically encouraged me to push what I thought a poem was and write what I want a poem to be. Um, so I'm going to start with what came from that like first experiment. Endless winter. I have trouble sleeping at night. My teeth are cold. I hear they found a way to unboil eggs. NyQuil gives me nightmares. Don't give me that weird look. You're a ghost, but don't worry. You're like a cool ghost, kind of. You still don't like Echo and the Bunny Men, but fuck, that doesn't mean you need to turn it down. Quit touching my stereo, playing all that sax. Shouldn't your ghost body just pass through? A ghost in the shell, am I the shell? How are you even doing that? A scratched up dirty mirror, I haven't looked at it in days. Are you still behind me, jamming? This is damn fine coffee. I know how much you love sound chats. I'm so tired, don't give me that, I'll forget this in the morning look. That please don't text anyone else about this look. That please don't post this look. BRB, I'm reading about echo locating. I feel like shit. You're always online, just don't write about this if you can help it. Still the ghost in the shell. I need a break from screens. I can only see you through glass and it's fucking with my eyesight. I'm writing a song about carpets. It doesn't have any words. I'm still having nightmares. You cut my hand off in one of them. I had to sew it back on. I don't know if it's a seasonal thing. The bright is too bright for this room. I should put my phone away earlier. I need a good night's rest. I'm breathing through one nostril. Everything tastes like ice. My skin is dry and curling off. I still can't fucking sleep. You told me to try Zico. The sun hasn't come out in a month. I might not dream, but now this cough won't go away. I don't know which is worse. The shell is rattling. I wipe flecks of coughed up spit and phlegm from my screen with an old napkin. Can ghosts feel sound? I read weird articles to pass the time. Let's talk conspiracies, maybe. I haven't gotten out of bed. I hit keys fiddly. I almost turn on the webcam. The NSA is watching us. They've climbed into your shell. We've been evicted. Fucking rude. 
They may have tapped our phones. So I should tell you the worst thing. You're gone. I am feral. I crawl out of my body, this body of mine. There is a seam in my belly. It splits. I crawl out on all fours into the snow. My skin suit melts into gooey slush. I am a hellhound. I am feral. And I still don't get jazz. <laughs> Little King Trashman. We're in the woods. I tried to tell you, black people don't like the woods. What's the point of climbing a rock? Isn't your life full of enough adrenaline, enough nerve, enough fear? No, what a luxury. I'm singing loudly and beautifully and a little blue bird flies into my mouth with enough force to split itself in two. I pick and spit the feathers and bones and flesh out of my mouth, trying not to swallow its head. The ground, my hands, my mouth covered in tiny blue bird. We're supposed to go rock climbing, nature boy, you and me. You walk ahead without me. You don't notice my singing has changed. Maybe my song sounds the same as gagging. Maybe you don't notice the birds have stopped tweeting. Maybe. Nothing is going to stop you from climbing that rock, especially not me and my little blue bird. This is boyfriend. My favorite fruits are the ones with inedible exteriors, hard skins you have to cut away, thick skins you can't chew. Someone tell that joke about vegans eating orange peels, quick, before you miss this moment of pure comedic timing, before someone else quips about the smell of durian, before someone Googles sugar apple. I tried to write something about my beating heart, but, I'm looking for another way in to myself, thick, skinned, rotting fruit, sitting in a metal bowl facing the sun. Soon the heart will give in to the rot, won't taste as sweet, will smell the wrong kind of sour. Mm -hmm. As per my last email, this seems a bit too dramatic. A bit too fucking much. The cruelty of a hive erupting in a belly button on a nipple beneath an eyelid. Places too tender to scratch some relief into. I'm so often on the verge of tears. Won't you tear through me, please, so I might finally know what the fuck is going on. Starving for food, for a sweet kiss, to be held, to be taken seriously, to be taken softly for my island ravaged by hurricanes, but still here for the most part, for a place with a place for sway, the palms I knew when I was two and daydream of at 27. I might pass out from the hunger, nauseous from the emptiness, my twisting gut. I felt this for so long, I'm starting to think I deserve it. I'm exclusively on CP time or depression time. Are the two all that different from each other, all things considered? Running on, I don't want to be here, time, generally. So please schedule for me. Um, do I have time for questions? Yeah. One. It's the last one. 61520 to 61521, and on, and on, and on. The electrical lines got mad loud. Maybe a pigeon got shot. It sounded so much like a whistle, like an AO ma. Poor pigeon. A scratchy throat, nasal drip, a sinus x ray, desperately sucking in air. We outside, but only a little. My jaw has never been so clutched. The feeling of teeth pushing into each other, bone on bone, heavy pressure. She's so snatched, she has a cavity. 
human capital management via Zoom meeting, the discomfort of home. I clip peeling acrylic off my nails and shut my eyes as the pieces shoot across the room. Too fast to see where they land, somewhere, the wall behind me, ricocheting off lamps, their path undiscerning. Bouncing off the lens of my glasses, I jump and my heart rate spikes. My optometrist tells me, be careful with your left eye. If you lose it, you're fucked, but that's not really the case. No one seems to know what's up with my eyes. Consistently, a neck, pain, a migraine, unrelenting, an uncontrollable breakout along my jaw and right cheek. I pick and squeeze relentlessly. I hear of death, I hear it reopening. I force open the largest pimple on my cheek and watch it ooze. I wish I had developed a more productive stress response. Everyone else has a hobby now. I have another scab. I put retinol in the open wound and it stings. I can't fathom the look my esthetician will give me. Despair spiral. I do not dream of labor, but it is what I wake up to. A persisting violent dream leaves me unsettled in my skin. I've tried speaking it aloud, but the details are so foggy. No one believes their daughters. We're collateral, a marker of someone else's moral standing, the household prize, pride, or representative. None of these are paid positions. If a daughter has a hobby, too many friends, too few friends, takes a picture, takes a picture and loves it, takes a picture and hates it, doesn't want a nine to five, only wants a nine to five, speaks softly, speaks loudly, speaks, dreams of anything, it's a problem. In the pit of my stomach, the leeches I've swallowed are rioting and hungry. I wrongly swallow slugs to feed the leeches. Nightly, they all crawl back up into my throat and I gag until morning. One of my followers suggested I journal about it. So now I cough at least one slime ball up at night and press it into a clean page. It's overflowing. There, I've done it. Depression solved. Thank you to the mutual who suggested. I feel so relieved. <laughs> oh, that was interesting. Um, I wonder if uh, if anybody in the audience has any questions for uh, the future film editors or authors. I mean, not really, not a question at all, but I thought <laughs> I really enjoyed the readings. Thank you both so much. I thought it was really cool that there were so many kind of like, they were kind of speaking to each other um, and in a way that I don't know if you would anticipate it, but um, yeah, really cool residences, very like, Relatable. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question. It's interesting to hear about the relationship with the managers. Like, um, so, the managers are doing this. Like, for the work in like, this world with like magazine publishing and all that, which um, I know very little about, but it's really fascinating to hear about the evolution of sort of like working. It's also called Future Con, and I feel like Future is kind of the main thing. Which so much um, talk about innovation and about this person, and, and I'm just curious in terms of what you've written, where do you see the people kind of in sort of the, the future of the process of there in terms of maybe not just aspiration, but just sort of this evolutionary in terms of trace of history? So, in terms of like the work that's also being done, do you see like the direction that there is a really kind of structure? I'm interested. Yes. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm just getting started a little bit. Um, trying to get to see, um, and um, I think like the most obvious answer is, um, and I think I 
I think I prefer it that way. Because um, I think it the other way all the other work is good for itself. Um, and I don't know, that feels consistent enough with 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 our model of um, I guess selection and of production as well. Um when I mean one thing I would add is like yeah there's a lot of I think that as Aiden said it's kind of like evolving at its own speed but we have this we have like different curatorial impulses. So like we have this main series that we have as the guest editors and that kind of unfolds in, in a way. And then we've added, you know, uh, this other features award where we kind of directly choose books once a year. So that's kind of an interesting added other way of directly, like it kind of changes the, the the, the possibilities, like so, we can maybe correct for things we don't feel are showing up enough, or you know, we can kind of um, we have some more direct input. And then the feature feed that that um, that you know, uh, Saban and, and Aaron talked about, which is our online platform. I mean, that's that's kind of interesting. So I think, in a way, the future is like. Kind of expanding in these kind of careful ways to see what the possibilities are, and maybe we'll expand in one way that we don't like, you know, and we'll stop doing that and try something else. So I think we kind of try a lot of things, and and I think that it's just kind of a in a way maybe just a little bit of a lab uh, that that we like to think about it, and it's kind of fun to try things that sometimes they won't feel fruitful and will go in a different direction, but that, that's the way that that keeps it exciting for all of us, I think, that, that we, uh, we kind of let it, let it you know, put something out there, see how it unfolds, if, it, if people seem to like it, then we kind of go in that direction, otherwise we kind of force it correct a little bit. And, you know, yeah, it's really fascinating. That's sort of like what I was kind of thinking about, you think there's sort of a, a kind of organic stream of like philosophy between the taxes of how you curate it as well as the kind of work that's you know. anyone else I mean um if I may if nobody else has um a question this question of labor um for everything is a question but labor, in terms of sort of finding a link between the, the, the two rooms, um, labor came up, and um, I'm wondering, you know, as, as a press that is sort of always undergoing its own process, you know, a nature that is always being written of and for the home. Um, what are some challenges that you face, um, or what are some of the benefits of um, this so sort of always being so close to the edge, you know, the avant-garde, right, or the, the vanguard, right? Like, what are the challenges as, a, as an operation uh, doing the labor of running the press, but also, um, you know, is, is there um, a benefit that, um, I don't know that often goes on for the uh, more traditional publishers. Because labor is, I mean, I mean, labor is, is, a, is big. There's the labor of love, but there's also the question of sustainability, right? Um, and if we want to continue pursuing and doing things together, right, we need to sort of foster a uh, space of care and, and nurture. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think that's the one thing I thought of. But uh, you know, I think I think that the art, the literary world in general, and I kind of really heard what you said. I was really glad you read that piece because it made me think about like what we do. Because I think in the conversation that's happening in the literary world and art world too about like art labor. 
the literary workers and and that it used to basically small presses used to run on volunteer labor mostly and still they still do you know, a lot of my volunteer time but um uh you know but other people's too and and you know um and authors and and so i think that um we try to you know where it's possible like really reflect people's work and, and what we projects we take on and how we pay people and like um and not try to take on things that we can't afford to pay people to do and i think it's it's different way of thinking but it's really rare and i think it's a really conversation that's happened with that literary art world and, and it's still kind of like I think the funders have finally kind of recognized that they need to, the level of funding that they need to, to support a project, you know, and it has to happen over time, but it needs to be not reflected. So I think that that's, that makes it a little bit more sustainable, but like getting back to the art part of it and everything, I mean, like, like, you know, we publish work, some of which they be they find a really wide community and some of which may be really like slowly get out there in the world and that's the benefit of being a nonprofit and um, we don't have to necessarily take only projects that you know there's the commercial aspect that you that you mentioned in the questions like I think I think that's that's we want to support work that you know we don't want to demand that people have a huge network to get published or you know, so that's kind of uh, I think the other aspect of it that's been fortunate and that's enabled by by people who read our books, teach our books, and you know, we are fortunate to get grants. So I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that. Um I mean I think there's a, a lot of benefit to it and I think that well what seems to be somewhat similar across the board of like the independent publishing community that you're a part of is that um no one's really in it for money um which imposes a limitation on certain parts of like a, my personal life for example um but also allow like liberates us in what we can do as the press um and like compared to like what we're beholden to make you know, um, and um, as well as the fact that that's like a real sort of like logistical hassle for, for, for everyone pretty much who like works as well as published. Um, I'd like to sort of say though that it kind of well, it keeps things earnest. And it's one of the things that allows us to publish on it, honestly, you know, and um, also, no one at Future Bone has Future Bone as their own kit. And I think that's important to know um, that, you know, we are sort of in a context where like, piecing things together is necessary. Um, not always easy to accept, you know, always working for it not to be the case, for sure. Um, and, um, I don't know. I also think that, like, you know, care, this idea of caretaking um, in publishing, in writing, um, it, it is kind of the most sustainable thing. You know, it might not be definitely not in like commerce sense, but in that sense, the only sustainable thing is, you know, growth at all costs. You know, and that's a value you can have. You know, um, that's not what I'm interested in. You know, yeah. um, and I think that's one thing that I like identify with very closely with you, Bob. You know, and that keeps me here. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the pivotal instant, the moment when labor turns into something to care, to desire, right? Because, like you said, um, nobody's in it really for the money. Um, it wouldn't be very smart to be. No. <laughs> um, 
Does anyone else have anything they want to ask or add, contribute to the conversation? Um, anything uh, either of you would like to, to add or conclude with? Yeah, I would just like to say, you know, like Jeff said, that the Bible is full of great examples Looks like one of to our panelists, editors, and authors, the feature film, Dan, for the evening step on the event. Thank you so much yeah. for um, carving some time out of your schedule to be here and telling us about your processes and your work. Um, I, I will say for public record, thank you to uh, Jim Carlo, your teammate, Carl, uh, uh, our um, our sponsors in the comparative literature department. Um, huge thank you to Coco Bitterman, who is a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, um, who helped out with um, posters and organizing and, and wine and everything. So thank you, Coco and Priscilla, <laughs> for uh, being tethered to, to today's um, labor. Um, and everyone for coming, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always have. Um, <laughs> Speaking of introductions to the press, uh, the link point, which came out late two thousands, that was that was my introduction to two thousand two thousand. Sorry. Now she's living, she's living up. <laughs> hands living up to her name. Um, there is, uh, for those interested, uh, another Reverie event happening uh, next month, co-sponsored with Saturnalia Books. Um, this will be held in a conflict student lounge in room 400 or 4,116. Nice. I got that. Um, and um, yeah, four one one six. Um, and uh, we will uh, be having um, a poet translator and professor, Marcella Sulak. And this is November second at six thirty, hosted by Sarah Wetzel, who is a conflict student and also I believe the editor of Saturnalia Books. Um, any future phone has some events I'm sure coming up, um, new books also coming out. So please follow them on social media and their websites. Um, and you can also follow Reverie on social media as well if you like. Um, there are books for, for sale if you'd like. Um, if you want to finish the wine, that's great. If not, um, thank you all so much for coming and enjoy the rest of the event. um, I see 10 live, I think I'm going to die.